Okay, good, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the seminar by the Instituto de Astrofísica de Andalucía here in Granada. And uh, today we will have a new seminar with uh, real people here at the hall of the Institute and also in remote mode in Zoom. And today the talk is by uh, Ginés Martinez Solaeche and he will talk about identification and characterization of emission lines galaxies with a J path. Uh, Ginés uh, made his uh, graduation in physics in the University of Valencia in 2015. Uh, then he uh, has a scholarship to make his uh, master uh, studies in physics or in particle physics and cosmology at the University of Pierre et Marie Curie at Paris. And then uh, he worked one year with uh, Dr. Jacques de la Bruel in the analysis of the foreground emission for the detection uh, for the detection and the cosmic micro, microwave background in the future space missions. And then he returned to uh, Granada and started to work in the group of uh, Rosa Gonzalez in, and in the collaboration of uh, GPAS. Uh, he, be, he made his co-author or author of uh, several uh, publications, and today he will talk about this identification and characterization of emission line galaxies with j -Pass. So, Ines, the floor is yours. Thank you, Renan, for the presentation. Um, I guess you guys heard me. Okay, I guess so. Um, I will go to presentation mode. Okay, so this is the title of the talk. Um, um, I'm gonna speak about uh, emission line galaxies in, in the context of JPAS. So let us start uh, with a brief introduction of what uh, um, JPAS is. Um, this is a survey, uh, wait a second, let, let me take, get rid of that. Sorry. Okay, much better. Great. Okay, so I was saying that uh, mm, to put in context a little bit what is JPAS, um, this is the observatory, uh, it's in Terrell in, in Havalambre. This is the first time that actually uh, I knew that Terrell really assessed. And it, there, is a, there is still a, a great observatory in one of the, spo in, on the, one of the <clears throat> regions in Europe that is uh, dark very, very dark, so we can observe the sky very well from there. There is a couple of telescope, uh, and there is one that is uh, the big one uh, of uh, 2.5 2 uh, meter telescope. So JPAS, uh, the experiment um, is, uh, is gonna observe the sky from, from this telescope, and uh, the JPCAM uh, has been installed there. Um, so JPAS has uh, many advantages, but uh, Perhaps one of them is its field of view. Here on the left, uh, we see an image of, of Andromeda galaxy. And uh, you see that uh, a galaxy as big as Andromeda uh, um, can be observed in, in the field of view of j -Pass. Uh, So that means that uh, j uh, will be able to scan 100 and 1,000 of a square degree in, in the northern sky. And uh, the other advantage is the, its uh, photometric system. So JPAS is uh, uh, built with uh, 56 uh, narrowband uh, photometric filters. And uh, that means uh, if we look uh, at the image on the right, uh, this is an example of, uh, of an emission line galaxy. Uh, the gray is the spectrum and color, color dots are are uh, the fluxes that JPAT uh, would uh, measure for, from the same galaxy. So you see that uh, um, this in practice is uh, like a, a low resolution spectrograph, right? So uh, these two ingredients makes JPAS a very, uh, very powerful tool for, for the analysis of, uh, of galaxies in general, uh, other many things, but uh, uh, in particular galaxies. And this is what I'm gonna talk about. Um, JPAS uh, has already um, started his observation, not with, uh, with uh, its own camera, but uh, with the Pathfinder camera. 
And uh, this camera uses the same photometric system as they pass, so they, they, they still have 56 uh, narrowband filters. Um, the only difference is that the field of view is a little bit smaller, but uh, it has managed to observe the edges field that is one degree square in, in the northern sky. And uh, here we see some, some of these images. Um, here, uh, what I'm showing is the, some of some of the observation of this AG field. In total, there are more than 4,000 uh, objects. And here uh, we see emission line galaxies in the top left. Uh, we see also quasars. And uh, you see here the comparison between uh, the j pass photometry and uh, the, the spectrum uh, from a Sloan. So you see that uh, we can actually uh, uh, track uh, the main uh, the main features in the spectrum using this uh, photometric system. And now let's move to some of the tools uh, that we use for for analyzed uh, uh, galaxies in in JPAS. And then I'll, I'll I'll go back to the edges field and uh, and show some scientific results uh, um, we we did in in the last month. So one of the tools we have those are again. Uh, uh, galaxies observed by by being JPAS in, in, in the edges field, and uh, one of the analysis that uh, has been used in, in within this group is uh, the fossil record that I'm sure you have already heard about. And the idea is uh, quite simple. So basically, we use uh, the energy the spectral energy distribution to infer uh, uh, the main properties of galaxies in terms of uh, the stellar populations. So uh, here there are some plots uh, of these properties. We have uh, we can retrieve uh, the stellar mass of the galaxy, the luminosity age, um, the, the amount of, of dust tension or, or um, metallicity. Uh, so you see there are uh, several instagrams that are uh, that comes from different codes, uh, from different seat, uh, uh, seats uh, fitting codes. But overall, uh, they are able to. So th basically, they have a different uh, assumption. Uh, they use different star formation histories and so on. But uh, at the end of the day, they they are able to retrieve uh, uh, in the same range uh, um, the the properties of galaxies in terms of of, uh, of a stellar population. Um, this is a work that has already been published. And uh, that has been led by by Rosa. Okay, so now uh, let's move to to something that I've been interested in during my thesis, uh, that is the nebular emission. So here we see a couple of images of the Orion Nebula, this famous nebula. Uh, on the on the left is the optical image, on the right the infrared image. And uh, um, what's normally happen is that uh, as new newborn stars. Uh, the mm, the ones that are very down they they are they are able to ionize the the interstellar gas and once uh, this uh, gas is ionized uh, it re emits radiation in, in the optical range uh, a different uh, wavelength <clears throat> so uh, by looking at, at these emission lines uh, we can actually uh, measure uh, the star formation rate and here, if we if we go back to this uh, this uh, spectrum of an emission line galaxy, um, w the idea is uh, actually to measure this line, right? But uh, if we zoom in here, uh, if we would have if, if we had a, a, an a spectrum, and we would like to uh, to measure uh, the emission line, uh, what people normally do is just uh, to use a Gaussian. Uh, a Gaussian uh, low to, or something more complex, but uh, but you can go directly to the spectrum and measure the, the amount of of, uh, of radiation that comes from H alpha, and uh, and then uh, you you are done, right? But here we have uh, also other lines that nitrogen too, so some, sometimes it's difficult to decontaminate uh, um, the radiation that comes from from this line or from H alpha. And if you try to do that with photometry, is uh, a little bit more more complex. And uh, above all, when in the case of JPAS, depending on the relative of the galaxy, it can happen that the line, for instance, 
as you as we see here in the in the image on the top right, that actually it uh, it's falling in in between two filters. So then uh, uh, measuring uh, measuring them is not as simple. And uh, if we look at other lines as uh, beta or so CN3, um, this is even uh, if they are weak, uh, it's even more difficult, right? So we develop uh, a new tool for for this purpose, and this uh, this tool is based on on machine learning, on concretely on artificial neural networks. So basically, we have uh, different uh, surveys such as Khalifa, Manga, or Sloan uh, that they um, they have measured uh, in in the in the spectra. Uh, the emission lines. So we use those, uh, those surveys to train the network. And the idea is, the, is basically the following. So we took Khalifa Manga. Remember that uh, this couple of surveys, uh, they observe uh, nearby galaxies in the universe. So um, that means that uh, the amount of galaxies is not, uh, is not very high. But uh, they have uh, been able to resolve this galaxy, especially. So basically, uh, they have a spectra from different zones within the galaxy. Uh, so in total, we have thousands and thousands of spectra uh, in which emission light has been measured. So what we do is we use Khalifa Manga. Um, we we took the spectrum, the spectra, sorry, and then um, we convolve the spectra with uh, with the JPAS photometry in such a way that we can uh, obtain the synthetic magnitude and the way that JPAS uh, would look at these galaxies, right? And since we also have uh, um, the fluxes of the emission lines or other, other quantities, we can use these, these two ingredients to train a network. And uh, once we, do, we did that, we, we made prediction in a slow galaxies. You see that uh, uh, in principle, there are uh, many ways of combining these surveys to, to train the network and then to test uh, uh, the prediction. But uh, we wanted to, to leave aside the Sloan um, because uh, each experiment had its own, its, its own uncertainties, its own uh, calibration. So if we, uh, in the training, we don't use anything uh, Related with Sloan, then when we when we look at its performance in in galaxies uh, uh, in a Sloan galaxies, um, we we are sure that we can predict uh, in almost any galaxy. And there is also another reason, and that is uh, the red shift. Uh, as I said, uh, while Khalif and Manga observe nearby galaxies, the Sloan goes up to um, one in red shift. Or, um, but the idea is that. Uh, we will look at the prediction that uh, we can do in galaxies that uh, um, that, that doesn't exist in Khalifa and Manga. And if we if still we are we are able to do this prediction, that means that in, in the context of JPAS, we will be able to uh, to measure uh, the emission lines uh, up to certain redshift. Uh, okay, so here is the network. This is how it's trained. Um, the input of the, so you, you have several layers, right? Uh, the first layer see the input is what do you, you fit, uh, uh, how do you fit the, um, the network? And actually there are, for each red shift, there is a different network that has been trained. And the inputs are the color related to uh, the filter in which H alpha uh, falls. So if I go back one second to this, to this plot here, this is a galaxy at 0.04. So H alpha falls in, let's say, 6,600 Armstrong or so. So I computed all the colors from, um, from this filter, right? And this is what I, I use as an input in the network. If we are another, if uh, we want to train the network at other relative, we yeah. computed the color respect to, to this other filter. And the idea is to measure uh, the equivalent width of four lines, H alpha, H beta, oxygen three, and nitrogen two. And well, uh, this is how it's trained, basically. In practice, the truth is that uh, 
the network has been has trained me more than I trained uh, him because uh, you see uh, at the end uh, you have to try several times you have to uh, try different uh, approach so you, you end up uh, training yourself uh, okay here are some of the of the results uh, in, in the simulation that we perform um, we have in in the y-axis uh, those are the prediction that uh, the network does in the Google and width of H alpha, top left. Uh, in the x-axis, those are the measurement that is loan, um, the measurement that has been uh, measured in, in, in the Sloan spectrum. So you see that uh, we are able to measure H alpha. Uh, I, I'm color coding on the left with the density, on the right, uh, on the middle, sorry, with um, with the red shift, so you see that there is no bias uh, in relation with the red shift. Uh, so that's good. Uh, we can measure H alpha up to uh, red shift 0.35. That is the limit uh, at which uh, uh, H alpha uh, goes outside of the of the J pass uh, range. And well, this is the, this is for for H beta. And here we have uh, the result for oxygen three and nitrogen two. Those lines are more difficult to, to constrain, actually. And, and you see here that there is, a, if you look at the CN3 line, uh, there is a branch uh, where, where we are under predicting the, the ghrelin width of a CN3. And this uh, applies as well uh, to nitrogen 2 line. Uh, so at the same time, uh, from 50 Armstrong or so, um, we, we start to under predicting the, the equivalent width, but uh, we are not doing as bad. Um, so if we look now at the ratios of those of those lines, you see that uh, in some in some region we we are able to, to retrieve the nitrogen to H alpha ratio, uh, but then again uh, a certain point uh, this start to um, so we, we start to under predict a little bit the the radio it that has an explanation that uh, um, I will tell you in a second and uh, when it comes to a CN3 and ATB the radio uh, that happened as well at high values there is a little bit uh, of a flattening so if we plot that in a in a BBT diagram this couple of radios on the y-axis, uh, oxygen-3 to H-beta, on the x-axis, nitrogen to H-alpha. Uh, those are, um, on, on the right, we have uh, mm, the Sloan uh, BPT diagram that's come from, from, from the spectrum directly. So those are measurements in the spectra. And this is how it's the, the BPT diagram. On the left is what we predict training uh, with Khalifa and Manga galaxies. So what, what you see is that uh, uh, the network has more problems in regions where the main initiation mechanism is driven by, um, by an active galaxy nuclei. So um, this happened mainly because uh, as we are training with, uh, with galaxies uh, in different zones, um, the number of zones that are in the middle and uh, um, that, that has uh, as well an AGNs are mm, are few compared to the total amount of uh, of of, uh, of uh, spectrum that we are using in the training. So at the end of the day, it has more more difficulties to train to to predict in, in this region of the um, of the VBT diagram. Um, so I, I want to show you here. Uh, this is. Uh, if we had trained the network with a Sloan, and then we predict in a Sloan, uh, you see that uh, things are much better, right? Uh, and you and you can think, okay, that's uh, that's all, right? If if we are able to do it, uh, why we should care about Kalma, about Khalifa, or or Manga? Uh, the story is that uh, if you are sat, if if you stop here and you are satisfied with this performance, this is. Here, the calibration and everything uh, is the same between these two surveys. So that's does not guarantee you that when you go to other galaxies, other experiments, uh, you will be able to to reproduce the, 
as well this this diagram. I don't have here the, the plots, maybe I can show you that later, but uh, uh, if we train with slow and then uh, look at the, how it's performing Khalifa or Manga, uh, we, we have other problems that are not related with the ATM branch, but uh, with, uh, uh, with the star formation sequence. Okay, so uh, let me talk now a little bit about uh, the uncertainty we have in our predictions. So this is a uh, JPAS spectrum that has been um, perturbed according to the signal to noise radio uh, that we have in, in the photometry. So imagine, imagine we have a, a signal to noise radio of 10. Um, we move these, uh, these fluxes according to this error. And we, we make, a, let's say, 100 prediction. So you have an idea of, uh, of the uncertainty you, you have in these lines. Um, here, uh, the signal to noise radio uh, that we can measure in the line, this is in the y in the y axis, is a function of the signal to noise radio that you can measure uh, that that we we have in the in the photometry. Uh, they are uh, related, right? And uh, but there is another uh, another variable here that is the the equivalent width of the line. For lines that have a high equivalent width, uh, with less signal to noise rate in the photometry, we still can measure them. But as lines are weaker, they, they, they are more difficult to, to measure. So if we, if we put that in, in words, um, for, for a line that has an equivalent width of 10 Armstrong, let's say, if we want to, to measure H alpha, that is the plot on the right, uh, we have to have at least a signal to noise radio of the photometry uh, of four. So if the, if the signal to noise rate is below this value, we cannot longer uh, measure H alpha for, for an equivalent width of 10 Armstrong, okay? And here I'm comparing, I'm comparing uh, this method that is uh, and the method based on machine learning with uh, what we uh, would be able to do if we, instead of using this method, we, we use something more traditional that is uh, based on the photometric contrast. So basically you measure um, the line in, in, in the filter that uh, take more, most of the flags, and then you measure the continuum and uh, you make the difference. So that's uh, the contrast. And this, uh, um, this uh, red line here, is the mm, how the signal to noise radio um, of in, in this line is related with the signal to noise rate in the photometry. So basically, we can do it much better that uh, uh, what uh, could be done uh, using other methods. Um, this work uh, has already been published, uh, and uh, and now uh, the idea is to to use. Uh, this methodology to exploit uh, the data in in the in the ages field. So this is what I'm I'm going to talk now. So um, as I said, uh, we have um, four thousand uh, objects in in the mini JPAS area. So we are interested only in galaxies. So among these objects, we select the ones that are galaxies. We put a constraint in in the recif. Uh, we don't want the uh, galaxies uh, to be to have a recif um, higher than 0.35, and also we put a limit in the in the R band in the magnitude of the R band. Uh, so this is our sample. We have uh, two, roughly two two thousand three three hundred objects, and you see there the relation between the the magnitude and the photometric recif. Um, here, there are, again, more samples of galaxies uh, in JPAS. You see also the image in the R band. And the emission lines are clearly visible in most of them. So the idea is to measure them with, with this method. Uh, so one, one of the first thing we, we look at was um, these uh, color mass diagrams. So we here, what we are showing is the U minus R uh, intrinsic color of the galaxy in function of the stellar mass. And on the, on the right, 
uh, galaxies are color coded with the luminosity luminosity h, and on the left they are color coded with the equivalent width of h alpha that we retrieve uh, using this method. So um, what we are obtaining is something expected. Uh, there, there has been uh, many many works that has already um, looked at these diagrams and have obtained similar results uh, that are basically uh red galaxies that has uh, colors that are redder they are more massive in average they are also older and uh, if you look at the at the equivalent width of h alpha they have low values so mainly they don't have emission lines right as galaxies um get younger um, they have um they 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 don't have they don't have uh emi they have uh, higher emission lines and uh, and they are less massive. Okay, so here we have a couple of diagrams, the BP diagram that uh, I already have uh, spoken about. And uh, so here, first of all, uh, I'm both diagrams, I, I will talk later about the hand diagram that is the one in, on the right. But both diagrams are color coded with the mass of the galaxy with a stellar mass. And uh, we are imposing that for a galaxy to appear in this diagram, uh, we impose uh, to have an error uh, in both uh, variables lower than 0.25 dex. If it's higher, it doesn't appear, OK? So among all the galaxies we have in the ADC, there are 255 that uh, goes in the PPT. And you see, um, how the star form the star formation win that is uh, this the part um, uh, that, that goes from high values of cn3 to h beta to low values of nitrogen to h alpha so this is a, a sequence actually so galaxies start to have uh, start with the low mass and then uh, as they become uh, more massive um they, they become more metal rich and uh, and also they have uh, less emission in in less amount of emission lines. Uh, so you see that uh, um, something that comes from from the emission lines from from this method and uh, other variables such as the mass that comes from the set fitting they are uh, compatible here and uh, tells the same story. Uh, if we look now at the hand diagram, that is the one on the right. Here we are uh, showing the uh, equivalent width of H alpha in function of the nitrogen to H alpha ratio. So here we only need two lines with only four. And uh, so that means that uh, we can uh, place more galaxies in this diagram because the error uh, uh, in, the, in the y axis is, is uh, in average lower. And also, since oxygen three is the line that is more difficult to to obtain, um, we can uh, benefit for uh, for removing this line and, go, and using only this diagram. And uh, again, uh, here in this diagram, uh, galaxies that are star star forming they they lie on the left, and as they and they become more massive, they goes to the right. So you you can use this diagram to separate between star forming galaxies, safer, and other species as liner passive or composite. So since uh, this is less costly and uh, we can place more galaxies in this diagram, we use that one to make a selection of a star forming and uh, try to measure the star formation rate for, for those galaxies. Um, in order to measure the star formation rate in the galaxy, first we need to get rid of, uh, to make an estimation sorry, of the amount of interstellar gas that is absorbing part of the of the emission in the in in the flux of H alpha. So, since we have um, H alpha and H beta line, uh, we can compute its ratio, and from there uh, we can obtain the color excess, and therefore um, the amount of nebula that's extinguished in at H alpha wavelength. So what I'm showing here it's uh, uh, in the start, in among all the galaxies that are star forming, I'm showing the relation between um, this uh, nebular extinction and the stellar mass. 
the dot uh, dot points are uh, medium values or in in ranges of uh, or in stellar mass beams. And uh, I'm comparing this with other um, with uh, other studies. Uh, we see in gray um, uh, the contours that has been derived from from our work done by Salvador in 2016. Uh, those are those come from a Sloan galaxies, and they have used uh, um, um, aperture correction to to estimate the radio of uh, H, H alpha and H beta. Uh, as you remember, maybe uh, Sloan uh, has a fiber of three arc seconds. So that means that the galaxies that are in the nearby universe, uh, Sloan only observe the central part. So if you want, if you want to know uh, mm, all the uh, flux that come from, from the whole galaxy, you need to apply uh, aperture correction. And this is what Salvador did. And uh, there is also another line that comes from another study or with the Sloan galaxies as well, but they don't use aperture correction. So you see that there is a difference in terms of uh, uh, using this aperture correction or not using it. And the good point of JPAS is precisely, is precisely that, right? We are not, uh, um, we don't have a fiber, we can observe the whole galaxy. So we are not biased in this regard. And finally, other points that are there comes from a cluster at 0.4, from Sobral in 2016. And well, we are obtaining similar results. So we use this uh, nebula extension to, to remove, uh, to, to, to add the contribution of, to, to have finally the, the H alpha flux, right? And from there, uh, using the Kennicott uh, conversion, we can estimate uh, the star formation rate that uh, each galaxy in the star formation sample uh, has. And since we also have the stellar mass, we can uh, um, derive this uh, star formation main sequence. And uh, so here we are, we are plotting the, um, we are color coding the, this graph with a parameter that is uh, tau divided by T zero. So that comes from the star formation history in the, in the set fitting, uh, we assume a star, uh, delta delay model um, and T0 is basically the starting point uh, of uh, when, when the galaxy starts to form a star. And tau is the, how extended uh, the star formation is in the galaxy. So by, by dividing these two quantities, we have an idea of whether galaxies are still forming a star or the its star formation uh, has started to decrease. And uh, what we observe again at that, that is that the galaxies that are above the main sequence, above the main fit here, they are more active in terms of uh, star formation. And the galaxies that are on the lower part, they are um, less active. So again, uh, you see that uh, one of the aim of this work is to use different tools, something that's come from, from the stellar population, from the set fitting, and something that's come from the mission lines that in principle, and so th th this method are, uh, are independent from each other. And we have tried to put uh, everything together and find consistent results. And this is again, proving that. Um, what we obtain is a, a slope of 0.9. And uh, at the, we, we have also retrieved the amount of intrinsic scatter and this is 0.2. Um, for this fit, we have uh, taken into account, of course, the, the errors, both in, in the star formation rate and the stellar mass. Um, here I'm showing uh, how this slope compare with other works. Uh, we have in, in empty symbols uh, come from simulation that predict a slope uh, of the star formation main sequence from 0 0.87 or so uh, up to a super linear slope. And uh, the, other, the, the other points that are not empty, uh, those are, it's come from experiments. Our, our result is the, um, the blue one. Uh, you see here, um, there is a gray point uh, on the top. Uh, this comes from a Sloan, and it's the same work of Salvador that use aperture correction. And there is a debate of uh, how this aperture correction uh, can affect actually um, the, the, the slope of the star formation main sequence. 
Uh, the gray points comes all from Sloan. So there are other points here that, that are on the, on the low part that feed the transformation main sequence Sloan and obtain lower results. And uh, uh, in principle, uh, this aperture correction can affect. So with, with JPAS, we don't have this problem. And what we are obtaining is something that uh, goes more in, in this line. Uh, okay, uh, this is just uh, this is the last plot I, I'm going to show. Uh, this is the cosmic star formation rate density. Um, since we have uh, the star formation rate for all the uh, star forming galaxies, and we can compute uh, the volume in a different relative bin, uh, we can finally obtain the, this uh, this quantity, the star formation rate density. Uh, here we are comparing, uh, there, there are many, many dots there. Uh, you see everything that is in gray, that come from studies that use H alpha to retrieve this cosmic star formation rate. And the other lines there that are in color, that are studies that uh, obtain um, this, uh, this quantity with uh, information of the stellar population. So uh, in, in general, there is a, there is a bias uh, between these two methods, and we are also obtaining that. So our, our prediction are a little bit lower uh, compared to uh, what uh, stellar population model had retrieved. Uh, in particular, uh, the black dots there; those are um, the those are um, the values obtained with the same galaxies that we are using here. But uh, with the method of the set of the of the seed feeding, and uh, well, there are several hypotheses of why this is happening, uh, and maybe a, actually this is a combination of several factors. Uh, we could be in, uh, underestimating the nebular station. This is a possibility. Uh, there are also a fraction of H alpha photon that can escape the nebula. And we are not taking into account that in the in, in our recipes for uh, converting to H alpha to the star formation rate, uh, and uh, it can happen as well that uh, the models that uh, um, retrieve the star formation rate density with a stellar population uh, overestimate uh, the amount of uh, younger stellar population, or even the the single stellar population models that predict the amount of ionizing photons are overestimating, overestimating uh, its prediction. So um, yeah, this is, uh, this is what we have obtained. And uh, this has been uh, all this uh, plot that I've showed you uh, are part of a paper that is going to be sent in in few, in few weeks uh, to astronomy and astrophysics. We hope uh, will soon be available for, for everyone. And just time, we'll move to the conclusion and the outlook for j -Pass. Uh, we have a, a survey that will scan an unprecedented uh, volume in the sky uh, around 8,000 degrees square with a very low resolution spectrograph. Um, so just uh, doing little numbers uh, with, uh, with this one degree square in the edges field, that means that at the end of day pass, we will be able to obtain the main genesis mechanism for 2 million galaxies in the universe. Uh, uh, we, we will retrieve uh, the main sequence for 9 million galaxies. And uh, we can also study the spatial distribution of galaxies because JPAS uh, will observe galaxies that are nearby and we can divide the galaxy in zones and, and look at the individual regions and use this method for that. And just uh, this work, uh, uh, this uh, machine learning method is just a starting point of other application that we can imagine. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, try to measure the oxygen to line that is in the H in the, in the ultraviolet region um, and uh, use that as a tracer for measuring the star formation rate. And, uh, and well, we can also use the images for training a network for, for now, we only use uh, spectrum, pseudo spectrum, but we're going to use also also images and try to to do more more advanced classification of galaxies in terms of morphology, nuclear activity, etc. Uh, so I will leave it there. Uh, thank you so much for your attention and uh, stand for question.
So thank you very much, Ines, for this uh, talk. And now uh, the talk is open open for questions for the people that are here uh, at the hall. Um, if you bring your own uh, microphone, yes, you, you can make your question with the, your, your mobile. And the people in the in Zoom, uh, I can see uh, one question here. Please, Mohamed. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Mm, no. Mohamed, we cannot. Ah, do you, you. Do, you, do you hear me no. now? Sorry. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> OK, sorry. So the photo Z is right now an input uh, to, the, to the method, because if, if, if I understood properly, right? That's right, Mohamed. That's right. Yes. So um, have you studied the error in the photo Z uh, and how that may affect um, uh, the, the, the final estimation, similar to the nice work you did on estimating the error of the photometry in each of the bands? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I didn't mention that, but uh, actually um, what the network does is it takes the photometric uh, estimation and also it takes a, it, its error to compute in all the in in all the relative within the error, um, it computed the um, the equivalent with uh, of those lines, right? So mm -hmm. then you have uh, for each galaxy you have uh, um, one hundred one hundred prediction for mm, due to the photo to the to the uh, signal to noise rate of the photometry, but you have also a prediction for in in each uh, relative beam. Uh, so then there is a kind of uh, average there, and also mm, there is a there is a way of um, mm, how to say that um, the network. Uh, so in each relative beam, we compute uh, the equivalent width, and then uh, there is a way to look at the uh, at the relative that provides the highest uh, sum of the equivalent width because this, uh, this correlates with the best relative. Um, I still have had uh, this plot in, in, in the presentation to, to make it more clear. But uh, if, you, if you look at the paper, uh, the, the, the first one the, that is already published, you will see there uh, more, um, a better explanation of what I'm talking about. OK, thank you very much. So oh, thank you, Mohamed. Then we have a question by Pepa, Josefa Masegosa. Please go on. Thank you, Ines. I, I enjoy very much your seminar. And, and as I have been working, trying to, to, get, uh, to get the result from Alhambra long ago. And, and so that is, I appreciate very much the effort you are doing getting the mission line object from from JPAS. I have a question related with Mohammed uh, asked already that uh, you are working with galaxies that you already know the relative. Am I right? Yeah, the photometric relative. Okay. So no, um, because I wonder when you you do the the exercise blindly. In, in the survey, and you don't know, uh, you don't have any idea, a priori idea of the redshift. Yeah. Okay. Let me show. Let me show the plot that will make it clear. So I, I, I would like to know that if, if you do so, uh, if how can you play with uh, with this? So can you constrain the redshift? in that way or how do you proceed with that because this is a... yeah so you know basically um, here in the when, when, when we did the simu when we did the simulation we we thought about that we know that uh, the relative will have an uncertainty so uh, we explore how um, if uh, we input galaxy that has a, an error in the in the relative how well we we could uh, retrieve uh, the equivalent with, and here are the results. 
Um, so mm, the thing is that we uh, we thought about a method to to correct if uh, somehow the relative is not well estimated, and this method is based in the in the sum of the equivalent width. So in each relative beam, you you make your prediction, and then you sum all over your equivalent width. And uh, what happened is that uh, uh, the right relative coincide with uh, with the highest sum in the equivalent width. So we have somehow a way to correct if the relative is not uh, is not provided uh, uh, well. And uh, you know here there are the the simulation we did uh, with an error of 0.01. We still can't measure H alpha. We of course the higher the error in in the relative, the more difficult it is to to obtain uh, the prediction, but still we can do a, a good job. Okay, and I have another question: Is uh, how do you get rid of the quasars and type one in your system? Um, well, um, in the in the selection that in the sample selection that we did at the beginning, uh, we imposed to have extended sources. Uh, so that comes from the extractor that computer. Uh, well, there are other methods, but uh, here in this work, we use the, the, the output of the extractor, and that gives us the stellarity or whether galaxies are extended or point sources. So we first we get rid of point sources. So we will not have uh, quasars or at least very few quasars in the sample, uh, but we'll have a safer two galaxies, that's for sure. But the safer uh, one? Safer one. Yeah, it, be, in, in principle, it, it's, well, it seemed to me very difficult to, to distinguish with uh, in, in, in these uh, photometric surveys if the, if the line is broad or, or is narrow. Yeah, so the thing is, if those objects are extended sources, um, they will be here for sure. And then mm -hmm. uh, the way of uh, getting rid of this object is based on the on the hand diagram or the BBT. This is the, this is the only thing we can do. No, but the BBT diagram uh, uh, doesn't uh, doesn't have any meaning if in type one sources because if the the Balmer line are, are broad it, it yeah. can be in any in any place of the BBT diagram. So yeah. that, uh, Question is that uh, that uh, maybe it's interesting to look at if we can distinguish between broad lines and narrow lines. Yeah. So yeah, it, th that would that would be a good uh, good thing to to look at. Uh, for the moment, uh, as I said, is the is the is the is the, is, mm, the, mm, the stellarity what uh, we are looking at. If the galaxy is extended and this is still a, star, a, a safer one, that will will be in our sample contaminating. So, but uh, yeah, the, the, maybe this is. Well, I suppose idea the to... contamination is is uh, it's pretty low because if you take any complete survey, the the percentage of type one. Uh, CFA would be a few percent, so that I suppose the contamination is pretty low. Yeah. But it, that is, it is nice to look at, uh, and I suppose because in J Pass there is a group working in Quasar, and they are working on on that uh, on that topic as well. So that's, that's mm, nice. yeah, there are there are other works that are. Mm, trying to separate between quasars at low receive quasar, but they don't make distinction between safer one or or quasars. So, um, but uh, I think uh, um, at some point when whenever we have uh, many more data of JPAS, it could be a good idea to use the images to maybe train a uh, machine to separate between between this, uh, this type of, of galaxies. But that for the moment, this is uh, this is what we have, and as you said, uh, maybe the contamination is not as high. No, no, no. I, I I'm pretty sure that this is not high. Thank you. You're welcome. May I do a comment to Pepa 
Sure. Uh, question is that the, the infatti is um, has been recently demonstrated by the um, but other collaborators that in fact the, the questions are very nice detected in the in the J bus and also they can measure even the full week maximum of the of the mission line. So that means that the um, obviously it depends on a lot of the of the um, the the line, the strength of the line of the mission line. To, to be detected or not, but I mean that uh, with j pass thanks to the to the resolution that we have with the filter, it is possible to clearly um, um, uh, detect the, the, the broad emission line and even to measure the full we have maximum of this line. And also there is another, I don't know why, but uh, uh, he never didn't present it, but even um, he is also working in a, in a, in this kind of analysis uh, using machine learning to to the to uh, to retrieve or, or to um, the the question um, um, uh, that it is uh, available in the well that it is in the mini J pass using also machine learning. And the other thing is that there obviously could be some uh, cipher one, cipher two line um, where the stellarity could be uh, not equivalent to a point source, and in that case it will be probably in our in a, in our sample. But uh, in any case, we put a lot of, a very strong constraint into the stellarity, which is point one. Why? It is the if the the source uh, uh, question um, will be around one, so that means that we are putting a, a strong constraint to the stellarity to be to exclude most of the of the of the AGS um, quasar uh, object. And we didn't find any when we analyzed the continuum. We didn't find any. That could be um, that couldn't be fit um, with the standard population model. So that means that if there is someone must then I mean the, the continuum list, it is not dominated by the WSR or the AGN line at the optical wavelength. Okay, thank you very much. For the comments and the questions here at the room, any question? No question here. Good. Okay. Uh, another opportunity in the Zoom. Okay, I see no questions. Thank you, Ines, for this uh, talk. And we will come back next week with the next uh, seminar. Thank you very much.